So well, let's move right to the discussion. I'll be posing questions particularly to each individual, but of course, as the panelists know, they're, they're welcome to provide any kind of follow-up co comments or rebuttals to any statements they might have, you know, have issue with or um, you know, spark a little bit of an idea. So we'll start with uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, based on what you've seen in uh, the, the media landscape right now, what do you see as the biggest challenges that the media are facing um, in light of the digital era? Well, that's a loaded question to start oh, it is. isn't it? <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, the biggest thing is that traditional media uh, continues to struggle uh, and scramble to find itself in the new digital world. At a time, um, you know, when I was a reporter, we were the, you know, the, the, the only game in town. I mean, there was, it was a sort of a limited uh, club and very few people could enter. And now anybody can be a journalist and any organization is going to have global coverage around the world. Um, so I think that... It's a very competitive landscape, and at the same time, uh, newspapers are struggling uh, to find an economic model that works. I'm not telling anybody anything that hasn't been talked about before. Um, but the one thing I probably want to circle back on is that uh, despite all the challenges out there, I still believe that content is king. And I still believe that uh, traditional um, news organizations have a very strong grip or have the opportunity to have a strong grip on the digital landscape because they produce credible, high-quality content. And if you look at some of the blogs um, in my world that have emerged in recent years, TechCrunch, GigaOM, uh, Mashable, uh, VentureBeat, I mean, what they're turned into is news organizations. They've left that sort of mom-and-pop kind of let's start a little website world um, because they've realized that co good content will drive revenue, will drive readership, and uh, will make you a, a vibrant member of the, of the media community, not just online, but media overall. So then how does, I guess as we call them, legacy media try to be as competitive to get those eyeballs and perhaps to get that brand advertising that might have gone towards the tech crunches and the, and the Boeing Boeings of, of the world in order to you know, still boost the revenue but still remain um, relevant in light of uh, how popular a lot of these digital properties are? And Mark, you can answer, or, or David, whoever feels comfortable. I don't know. I, I just think that uh, there's two big challenges right now. One is the economic challenge and that newspapers and magazines, for that matter, have to reinvent themselves from a financial model. It means slashing newsrooms. Um, the days of the high-paid uh, reporter are long gone. It's not an upper-middle-class, middle-class job anymore. It's for, and I hate to say this, it's for young, cheap people uh, to basically pump out as much content as you can. So whether it's uh, web updates, podcasts, I'm probably you know, showing myself to be a dinosaur of sorts. Um, but you know, it's whatever, you know, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, I mean, and they want production. Um, so that's one side of it. And the other thing is you know, uh, basically leveraging whatever mediums you can to attract eyeballs. It's a, it's a battle for eyeballs and everybody's playing in the same pool. And newspapers have to figure out uh, what makes them better, different, more exciting, more interesting, more credible, whatever it takes because it's bloody out there. So maybe that leads to Anjali. Do you want to respond to how newspapers will face in this bloody war? <laughs> the bloody war. Uh, from Canadian Business, I think, last month. Um, I, think, I think one of the, the things that Mark points out is it's about content and producing and storytelling. And I think newspapers have to realize that content is the way they need to go. It's not about all the bells and whistles. It's about how to produce that content in a way that engages an audience, whether it's at 7 o'clock in the morning on a mobile site or on your iPad, or it's 10 o'clock at night in the paper. We need to think about the way we deliver our content to different audiences, and working with partners like a Facebook or a Google and to get it out there to other platforms. The days of having users and, and our audience come just to our site to start their day with the news are long gone. So news organizations need to realize that. They need to realize that you know we the large piece of the internet pie in Canada, 24 million users, um, we're, we're not even a tenth of that. And how do we get our brand and our content out there? And it comes down to also the basic tenets of journalism is telling a story in different ways, depending on the time of day and the audience you're parsing it out to. Um, I do think that it's, it's a different type of skill in a way. And Mark's alluding to that. It's maybe not a cheap skill all the time, and maybe it won't hopefully in the future become that. But it's, it's a different way of telling a story. And we have to change the way a lot of traditional journalists think. And that's, that's difficult um, because it's ingrained in a lot of cultures and organizations. Uh, but I, I do think it can be done, and it's looking strategically at your content and how you deliver it um, baseline and taking the bells and whistles and, of course, developing as you go along, and, but keeping the focus on the content. 
So on that kind of note, this is a question for David. How has news consumption habits changed in, in your mind, and how are let's say, an outlet like yours adapting to the increasingly online and connected audience that want news quick, they want news credible as well, but they also want it delivered on various platforms? Yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear to everybody in this audience, the fact that you're here, uh, that, you know, consumption habits have completely changed from where they were 10, 15 years ago. You're not getting your news only, at, in my case, on the television side at 5.30 or 6 or 6.30 when you're watching your local or national newscast. Uh, you're getting it, whether it's on the radio driving to work or through Twitter or through Facebook or through the thousands of other ways. I mean, that's pretty standard that everybody knows that. What, what we did, and I can only speak on, on our end, was we we were a little late coming into the game on the, on the online space. Globalnews.ca is a relatively new venture for global and uh, you know we it, it gave us an opportunity to look at what we did best and kind of to the point that was alluded to I, I know that we cannot compete with a Mashable or a GigOM in terms of technology coverage that's not what we do um, we do local news really well we do breaking news really well we do community really well and we do it well with video so it, it's a natural jump to say take all of those elements and focus on what you do best so um, where we have gone is, is we really invested heavily in, in building our video infrastructure. Uh, we're the only uh, major broadcaster out there that, that streams all of our newscasts from across the country online. Um, we've really focused heavily on breaking news. Television newsrooms, I, I, my own biases tell me that we are inherently better at turning around breaking news than our print uh, compatriots. And uh, community, which is you know the personalities that we have and we provide locally and in, in the community um, to millions of Canadians every night, are recognizable faces and recognizable brands that, that move people. Uh, so really focusing on, on those elements is is where our strengths are, and we're going to really let the Mashables and Global Mail and everybody else focus on trying to get that TechCrunch person, um, because if you to kind of run it back to your to your question. People are going where they want to go to get the news that's relevant to them. And if technology news is relevant to them, they're going to go to Mashable. They're not going to go to globalnews.ca. But if local news is relevant to you and breaking news is relevant to you, then you'll come to us. Well, somewhat on that note, uh, this is a question for Elmer. Because of Facebook uh, Canada, um, I'm sure you've noticed how often people are exchanging uh, news articles to each other. You can just look at, of course, your own news feed and see lots of people creating almost like their customized newspaper um, when they go to their homepage. So it feels like the news is coming to a lot of people instead of people actually going to a newspaper like in the old days. Um, and I'm sorry if I show my age here there too. Um, if, can you just speak on where, where does Facebook fit in that kind of media conversation? So we've really observed two changes. So first of all, content is absolutely the key, right? If we look at the consumption on Facebook of, um, of the content and what is actually engaging people, great content trumps everything. But two things changed. Um, the first one is how people actually receive and consume the news, and that's, you, you've spoken about the news feed, so Angelie's point about you know people waking up and looking for the news, they still do that, it's just they do it on a different publishing platform, and now they do it um, for Canadians. We've got about well over 15 million Canadians who are active on Facebook, and a majority of those uh, are active every single day. So they're actually consuming their news and receiving the news through their news feed on Facebook. But the second thing that fundamentally changed that we are observing is the curation of the news that they're receiving and who's actually editing and filtering. So um, in the past, um, you've got uh, publishers and editors who's actually curating what we see. And today, it's actually our friends, right? Each and every one of us have a very unique Facebook experience because we have different friends and therefore the content that we receive is quite unique and personalized for each and every one of us. So you can actually look at it in a way where your friends are sharing and recommending news that they think is interesting to them or they think that it's something that you may be interested in. So Homer, I mean to your point, um, does anybody use RSS Reader anymore? Google Reader? I mean, I mean, because it's sometimes. But I mean, the fact is that I get most of my news. I have a RSS reader with a couple hundred blogs on it, but I never read it anymore. I get most of my news from Facebook and Twitter, and that's going to your point about curation. And I do wonder about the role that curation is playing, and the fact that we're it's great because it makes life easy, but it also gives you a warped view of the world because you 
you basically sort of pick what you want to see as opposed to getting a broad spectrum. Yeah. So that's kind of an inter interesting point, right? So on average, uh, globally, uh, Facebook users have about 130 friends. So I know if I put 10 of my friends together, they all have different points of views, they all have different interests, they all come from different walks of life. So um, what we are noticing is that that curation that's happening from your friends, the wisdom of your friends, um, has two elements. One is this idea, uh, this element of um, both spontaneity and serendipity, like things that you'd never thought you'd be interested in, but you are. Right? I have a friend who's obsessed over country music. I've never really listened to it, but you know, it's coming through my newsfeed, and I get interested in it. The second thing is actually, you know, just the breadth of the types of friends that you have and the breadth of points of view that you get. Um, I would actually argue that um, it is uh, as uh, varied as what you may uh, consume from just picking up a newspaper and having different opinion op-ed pieces in there. Do you agree, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> the, I, let me, uh, to, to counter, sort of go against that. So Facebook may be a different beast because your friends have different interests, but Twitter is an interesting phenomenon because you usually you're picking your friends, right? You're picking your followers. So for me, consciously or subconsciously, my followers are all sort of in the digital realm, right? So I get a very kind of, you know, all-encompassing digital view of the world. I'd like to follow people who, who are into politics and the environment and other things, but it doesn't really interest me. At least not as much. Um, but the other thing is, I only have so much time in the day, so I really have to limit what I, what I follow. Uh, but then again, I still read newspapers, so I'm kind of a hybrid of sorts. <laughs>